continue our journey through the Word of God. We're going to be in John chapter 8. And uh, I don't know if anybody here knows, there's, real, there's two incredible, memorable events that happened on this day uh, years ago. Anybody want to take a guess what one of them is? If anybody here is over 57 years old, 60 years old enough, you probably know what I'm going through. And the young people have no idea. It's a guy named President John F. Kennedy. You guys, anybody remember him? Yep. He was assassinated today. It's actually a memorable day, but not a very good, uh, it's an infamous day, I guess you could say. And what I consider one of the most important memorable dates is uh, actually November 21st, yesterday. Um, in 1976, 44 years ago, um, the movie Rocky came out. In the theaters. So uh, I remember watching that um, in the theaters, you know, and I went with my father. And at the end, I'll never forget, everybody jumped up and clapped. And I looked up at my dad, and he was crying. Yeah, I never saw him cry other than at the end of Rocky. And so, uh, Truly one of the best screenplays I believe ever written. And I know it's my opinion, but um, it, is a, it is a wonderful movie. But if you really think about incredible events in history, um, God did something uh, 1,987 years ago, I believe. And that was in AD 33, when Jesus Christ came, God in the flesh, and literally put a sword in the middle of history. What everybody was expecting to happen at the end of history, God made happen at the very middle of history and time. And that was the resurrection. The resurrection was not a um, uh, the way that we think about it now. Um, a lot of times when we think about resurrection, we sort of think because we have a lot of the philosophical ideas in our mind about heaven, we often think of the resurrection being an outer body. <laughs> or disembodied experience when really the word resurrection means the physical dead body rising up, standing up. The, the a, a resurrection is a literal um, somebody that was dead and now that person in the same physicality, in that same way, is risen from the dead. And of course we know Jesus came as flesh and bone fully 100% God and fully 100% human, giving us a picture of what our bodies and our physicality will be like at that time. And the people of the Jew, most of the Jewish people did believe in resurrection, but they always thought it was going to happen towards the end of time. It will happen at the end of time, but God fixed what was broken by sending his son to, to take creation that had been contaminated and dying and going further and further into that anti-creation and God sent Jesus Christ to launch and implement a new creation. So we have a division of history. And ever since then, the, the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christianity has literally impacted in every aspect of the way that we live our life to this day. Modern hospitals, uh, government structure, art, education, every aspect of society, the gospel has impacted it and changed it and shaped it. And God has given us a vocation, each of us here. Every one of us here is specially, uniquely made in the image of God for a very specific, extremely valuable purpose. And so how do we find that out? We go not to our own ideas. We don't go to the world's ideas. We don't necessarily have to go out and fill our minds with information, although that's good to read and to learn. But what we do is we go to the living, inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God that God promises it will pierce us like a sword. It'll go down to the deep context of our bone and it will split it it will divide it and giving us a picture of how sharp and penetrating this word is but the key is is is, is, is this look we know what the end is going to be regardless of how we believe it's going to come regardless of what your view of the end times is we know we're all going to end up in that new heavens and new earth resurrected where the light of christ is going to shine 
brightly so much that John in the book of Revelation compares it to the sun not even being needed anymore. The very source of our life on earth. If the earth was just, you know, a few inches figuratively closer to the sun or a few inches further from the sun, life would not be able to exist. That's how dependent we are and how perfectly this earth is made in the, glo the glory of God. And John, John says that's not going to be needed anymore because the light is going to be provided by Christ. And so we often, when I, when I think about that, it's very exciting, right? And, but God doesn't necessarily pick, give us a connect the dots. Here's the five-step plan, you know, like we like. Here's how to do it. It's, he gives us these signposts and he gives us these, you know, looking through the dark glassly sort of instruction. But he tells us to trust him and to trust his word. And for a lack of a better way to say it, to follow the light. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet, says the psalmist. But in this chapter of the book of John, Jesus starts to continue, actually. He continues to be radical and revolutionary in his words. But here he starts to become very specific about who he is. He tells us that he is the light of the world. Which, when we look at that, and understand exactly what it means. I believe we have the answer in terms of the path, the story. Where's the narrative going? And I often like to, you know, I love watching film and reading books. I, I'm a book nut. I love doing it. And oftentimes, especially when I'm reading a really good book, I, I like to go to the back of the book and find out how it ends. I like to go, a lot of times we'll be watching movies at, at our house and I'll punch into Wikipedia and I go to the plot and I find out how it ends. And, and then I start to act like I guessed it, you know, with all my kids around. And I know what's going to happen here. He's going to do this. And you're like, how do you get all those twists and turns? Well, I don't know. I just like to do that because I like to study from a creative perspective where the author or where the filmmaker is going. Why is he making these choices? And the cool thing with the Bible is, is we know where we're going to that new heavens and new earth. But oftentimes we, we, we lose track of the narrative, right? We lose track of, okay, well, how are we to get to that point? Who are we supposed to be? What are we supposed to do? And Jesus makes it very clear. And he says that he is the light of the world and that we are to follow him. There's something called a, what is called a circadian rhythm. Am I saying that right? Circadian rhythm. I don't know if you've, if you've ever heard of this before, but those of you that have had children, one of the things they tell you, especially new parents, when you take your baby home from the hospital, they tell you that, you know, the baby's going to be crying a lot and it's going to have irregular sleeping patterns until they get their circadian rhythm, which is going to tell them the difference between day and night. And oftentimes what happens is, is when the baby is crying throughout the day and then finally the baby falls asleep. I remember with, with my children, especially the boys, we wanted to get, put them in another room, shut the door, shut the lights, put the blinds down and put signs on the door and just be like, anyone that approaches, you know, just, you're done. Just get away from me, get away from my house. You know, the kids are sleeping, right? But then when I learned about this circadian rhythm, I found out that if you put a baby in the bedroom during the day with the lights out, their body starts to adapt to that and you pay for it later, like in the middle of the night when they wake up because they're not tired anymore. So the circadian rhythm, it basically tells your body what is dark and what is light, what is day and what is night. And it starts to remember that and pattern it. And that's why when you travel and go to different time zones, you can adapt quick. Your body will adapt to those new times. And as a child, it's very, very important that we put them into a situation, put them in the bedroom, but keep that light on so they know they may be tired, but then at nighttime, you want to train them with the darkness. And I think about this, and I often think about how many of us here are walking, I believe, and we struggle to walk in the light. And we oftentimes find ourselves walking in darkness. And we find out that we've been in that darkness for so long that our circadian rhythm 
spiritually maybe, is off. We get used to that time, that used to that darkness. We get used to, we, we start to compensate for it. We stop trying to fix it. We sort of succumb to the fact that I guess this is just the way that it is. <clears throat> this is just my lot in life is to have this struggle, this darkness or this cloud over my head all the time. But Jesus seems to disagree. John seems to disagree. He tells us that if, if we follow Jesus, we will have the light of life and we will not, we will not walk in darkness. So what I hope to accomplish today is by going through these uh, 12 or whatever verses, 10 verses, that those of us that are struggling with darkness or those of us that were maybe coming into that cloudy area or when you get to that cloudy area, you'll be able to push the reset on the circadian rhythm. You'll be able to get lined back up again with the proper light, which is Jesus Christ. And that's what these Jews were doing at the time, the Pharisees. They were walking in the darkness of unbelief, and they were unable to see the true identity of Jesus and the amazing gift he was offering them. They were making excuses, you know, making, seeing Jesus do miracles and saying, oh, you know, what right do you have to do that on the Sabbath? Imagine you're a starving homeless person and you're offered food by a, by a local chef. He's the greatest chef in the area. He's on all the magazines that go around and they take all the food surveys and do all that. And you see this man walking up to you and um, he says, listen, I've made you a meal. Take this food. I'm the best cook in the area. Now you starving, haven't eaten in days. You don't grab the food. Instead, you challenge his credentials. How do you know? How do I know that you're really the best chef in the area? I'm not eating this food. You're testifying about yourself. Absolutely ridiculous. But this is what the Jews were doing with Jesus. He was performing miracles on the Sabbath, being and doing the very thing, illustrating, emulating, and embodying the very God that they were trying to serve. And instead of believing in him, their unbelief challenged his authority. They were unable to see the light because they were in darkness, walking in darkness. So right now, just to give you perspective, we are in the second half of the Feast of the Tabernacles. So John chapter 6 was the Passover. Remember John, Jesus said, um, you know, he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood uh, abides in me, but he that doesn't do that has no life in me. Jesus was talking about appropriating him, believing in him, having that intimate relationship, belief, and dependence upon him. That's what he was talking about there, but they did not want to do that. So he used these uh, adjectives and these uh, descriptions of consuming him in an urgent, devouring way, parallel with the Passover meal, when they were supposed to eat in haste. And Jesus was saying that I am the true Passover. I am giving you a new Passover, as we're going to see, the Lord's Supper, uh, the bread and the wine, symbolic of that. And then six months, we jump six months ahead of that, I believe six months or to a year. And now we're in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the last of all the great feasts every year. A celebratory feast, a feast that commemorates the time when the Jews were rescued by God out of Egypt led and provided for in the wilderness every single day, dependent on him for 40 years. And so they would build these booths out of all these different plant material, and they would live in those for a week, a seven-day period, commemorating how God provided for them in the wilderness. And Jesus, we're going to see in this passage that we're going to talk about, has a lot of the same conversations there as he had in John chapter 7 at the Feast of the Booth. And then we found out that last week that this woman who was caught in adultery was a fragment of text that's not in some of the earlier manuscripts. And we've discussed like, well, yes, we believe that this is scripture, but why did they put it here? Because in some other manuscripts, it's located at the end of Luke and in the middle of John over this side. Well, we believe that John is trying to give us that narrative story. He's trying to show us that Jesus was trying to convince the Jews that he was God. 
And John was using both some parallelism here between Jesus and Moses, between the deliverance from Egypt and the deliverance out of the new Egypt, out of exile. And he was, he was comparing these two things. So he puts this woman caught in adultery in this between really these diff, these these cons, this con, this continuous type of scene. So if you if, if you look at John chapter seven verse fifty two, remember they were all talking about cons, they were they were in actually the temple conferring with each other. What are we going to do? And then Nicodemus said, "Well, don't we do we don't judge people, you know, before we talk to them?" And he said, "We're not also from Galilee." Search the scriptures and see that if a prophet ever comes out of Galilee. That's the end of John 7. And then we go to the woman caught in adultery, which I believe John put there to show the spiritual adultery of Israel and the spiritual adultery that we have against God. Because idolatry really is the common denominator of all sin. We talked about that. Making a God in our own image. <clears throat> well, your God is like this, but my God is not a God like that. My God isn't the God that you follow. My God is this. And then they typically people will speak about a God that they fashion in their minds. And that's sort of what the Jews were doing. But they put in this chapter, this chunk of chapter eight, I believe, to point us to there. So John chapter seven, verse 52, you're not also from Galilee. And then we go right to where we're at now. John eight chapter 12 and it says then jesus spoke to them again so this is a connecting verse transition here he said i am the light of the world he who follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life so the pharisee said to him <clears throat> you are testifying about yourself your testimony isn't true and the rest of our passage today is jesus answering this you know, and, and I believe that John shows us three things that Jesus is trying to tell us. <clears throat> the number one thing I believe he's trying to tell us is that Jesus is the light of the world as the God of Israel. He's telling us, secondly, that he is the light as the true Israel. Jesus is the true Israel. And he's also saying that he is the light as the true human being or the true the tr or the second Adam, which we're going to talk about. So Jesus is the light of the world. He's the light as the God of Israel. He's the light as the true Israel. And he is the light as the true Adam or the second Adam or true human. And so the first thing that I believe he shows us here and what Jesus is trying to do by saying he's the light of the world is to show that he is the God that they have been waiting for to rescue them. And remember in John 7, he's, he's talking about Moses. He's having this conversation with the Jews about the fact that, you know, you have this law that tells you, well, you know, don't heal on the Sabbath, but yet you'll circumcise a baby on the Sabbath. I'm making the whole person whole and you're doing circumcision, but you're getting mad at me. When circumcision is to point, to the full ultimate healing, cutting of the flesh in the future. So Jesus challenged them. So when he says, I am the light of the world, he is trying to bring them back to the passages that, first of all, that Chris read um, from the Old Testament this morning. The passage that Jesus is paralleling to the God of Israel who said, I am. Okay, the word I am means... Well, it means Yahweh. It's called a, a, a tetragrammaton, which uh, whoever's translating, Elvira is going to have a hard time with that one. But it, it, tetra means four, and grammaton means letter. So Yahweh is Y-H-W-H. -H. And they don't put the vowels in there, so that way when they say it, they don't say the whole name because they believe that that would dishonor God to say that word. So Jesus is saying, I am. I am the one who is the light of the world. Jesus was saying that he is their light in darkness, paralleling the Exodus light that led them through the wilderness. There was a fire. There was a pillar of cloud by day, Exodus 13, 21. And then at night, there was a pillar of fire that led them through the darkness. Jesus is God, and he is the light that saved them out of bondage. Now, what he does next is he uses this language in the rest of this passage. 
to, I believe, compare himself and further show them who he is by recalling and echoing some of the things that they would know in the Old Testament scriptures. So he says, Jesus answered them and said, even if, my, even if I do testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. But you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I'm not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me are together. Even in your law, okay, he's going again. And this is a this is a continuity from the time he was talking about Moses. Now he's again talking and referring to the Torah. Even in your law, it's been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him. So Jesus tries to convince them first of his authority by showing that he is better than Moses. Because yet they believed and followed Moses into the wilderness when they didn't know necessarily where he was from. As you know, that he was an Egyptian. And what happened, the passage that Chris wrote read today was that what? Moses was judged according to appearance. If you remember, Moses killed an Egyptian to save one of his people when he found out he was a Hebrew. He didn't say, hey, I'm one of the Hebrews now. He just saw it happen and he killed him. When he did that, two other Hebrews saw him do that. Or other Hebrews saw him do that. The next day, he sees two Hebrews fighting. And he goes to try to break it up. And what do they say? Who made you a ruler or a prince over us? Who gave you the right to judge us is really what the scripture says. So Jesus is referring back to that. He's saying you judge according to the flesh. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. Yet you don't believe me. But yet you followed Moses, who didn't know where he was going, didn't even know where it came. And the same thing here, but you're, you, you're judging according to the flesh, like you did then. Moses was your deliverer, you judged him, and you rejected him. The name Moses happens to mean drawn out of water or saved from water. As we know, Jesus is the living water that gushes out, becomes a fountain. Moses killed an Egyptian to save a Hebrew, and he was rejected by his people. Jesus will lay down his life to save Israel and was also rejected by his people. They didn't know where, as I said, where Moses was from. He was an Israelite. They didn't know where Jesus was from. And they rejected him. He was the Messiah. <clears throat> they knew Moses from the scriptures that Moses had a father. But where, G where was Jesus' father? This is where they're saying to him, where's your father? At least we could testify that Moses was a Levite. His father, Amram, is in the scriptures. We know who he is, but where's your father? Who's, where's your authority coming from? And this was a dig because Jesus had the reputation of being an illegitimate child. Because his wife, Mary, Joseph's wife, Mary, got pregnant before they were even married. And so there was reproach there. There was rumors there that we're going to see towards the end of this chapter. They say, we, we weren't born of fornication like you. So Jesus is saying, oh, I know who my father is. You don't know who my father is. <clears throat> and we can go further into this, but Jesus knew where he was from and he knew where he was going. They rebelled against him like they did in the wilderness. Again, we see the, the folly of this. There's a rumor that um, one of Thomas Edison's college professors says that he could not he said that he could not accept his harnessing of electricity as valid until he showed his university credentials. That's sort of, again, what's happening here. They were unable to see God in the person of Jesus. I'm amazed by this one story. His name was Eric 
Weinenmayer. He was born uh, with a disease called retinoscosis, which is a disease of the retina, which causes you to completely lose your sight gradually over time. He, he lost his sight completely when he was 13 years old. Now, we've talked about this before. Blind people who have seen in the past have the ability to better compensate with their other senses. See, if, you've, if you go blind now after you've seen for some time, your body can help compensate quicker um, because you have a perception of obviously objects, uh, physical reality, tangible things. So this man lost his sight at age 13 and he spent his whole life overcoming what were seemingly impossible challenges to ultimately become one of the most accomplished, accomplished adventure, adventurers in the world. In 2001, he was crowned the first and only blind man to reach the summit of Mount Everest. He also climbed the seven summits and a big ice space in Nepal. He's written various books. He uh, contributes to charities. He actually started a charity called No Barriers, which aims to aid people with various disabilities to live full and rewarding lives. He's, like I said, two books, and this is a really amazing guy who's done so much and is doing so much for people that are in need. So the, the point of this is, is that when you're physically blind, you can do really good things. When you're physically blind, you can compensate. You can have a memory. Even if you had no memory, you were born blind. There's ways that you can read. There's ways that you can compensate. But when you're spiritually blinded to the point that you are rejecting the God of the Bible, that you are rejecting the truth of Jesus Christ, there absolutely is no way to compensate for that. Jesus is the only way out of the darkness. The only true, valid, authentic way to get rid of the darkness. You can, in the darkness of your life, you can medicate, and I don't just necessarily mean physical medication, you can medicate yourself. You can do things that distract your mind away from the darkness. You can bring in false light, whatever that may be. But ultimately, it's going to lead to the same darkness that you started out with. Because only authentic light, the true light of Jesus Christ, can take us out, as Jesus says. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. Okay, this is an absolute negative. You will not walk in darkness. You will have the light of life. Remember in the first chapter of John, we see that in him was life and the light was the light of men in verse four. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. There was a true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. It's the only way to do it. Darkness does not overcome you all at once. Darkness gradually overcomes you so you get used to it and you start to see better in the dark. As you know, at night, if there's just a small dimmer of light in the room, which there's even the moon or whatever it is, your body adapts. And before you know it, you're starting to see. I believe there's counterfeits like that in our spiritual walk. We start to think that we're starting to see better. We're starting to assume that there's light shining in. We must be on a good path, but it's just your eyes adapting. It's not. The light that Jesus Christ gives you will blind you. Jesus said, if you really want to see, become blind. <clears throat> we have to know that he is the only way to do that. I want to encourage you, if you are walking in darkness, to focus on the light of Jesus Christ and know this, wherever you're at right now, Lord Jesus knew you were going to be here when he saved you. You're not surprising him. He knew you were heading in this darkness. But the beautiful thing about grace is that it's non-refundable. Once it's given to you, it's never retracted. It's an amazing gift. But if you don't receive it, it absolutely does nothing. How do you do this? Humble yourself. How do you see the light of Jesus Christ as the God of Israel? Humble yourself. Confess your sins to the Lord. Take his correction. 
and know and know that to be to feel undeserving about the love that you're getting and to consent to be loved by God while you feel unworthy and while you're in the darkness is the great Christian secret. Number two, Jesus is the light as the true Israel. This is the picture that we saw, the woman caught in adultery. I am the light of the world. You see, the people knew immediately, anytime you spoke of light to a Jewish person, they were thinking and hearing Isaiah, that they were the light to the nations, Isaiah 46. I'm sorry, 42, 6, and 7. As you were going to be, I, I will appoint you, God says to Israel, as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those that dwell in darkness from the prison. So this is what Jesus is referring to as well. He's referring to that light from Exodus that kept them out led them out into the wilderness. He's referring to the light at the burning bush. He's also, what that Chris read today, and now he's also referring to the light as Israel, the light to the nations. We see in Isaiah 49, 6, and in Acts 13, 47, where Paul says this to the Jewish people that rejected him, I placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the world. Israel's job was to be the light, okay? Israel's job, imagine Israel as a flashlight, okay? Here is your job. Take this flashlight and go give light to the room. And Israel went in there and never turned it on. And then finally, when they did try to turn it on, it was too late. Battery's dead. Now, Jesus says, okay, you, Israel, were supposed to save the world. The world was supposed to be saved through you. You were supposed to be a light to the nations. But guess what, Israel? You now need saving yourself. So Israel was failed as the light to the nations. There's nothing more grievous to a father than a son who was foolish. And I'm not looking over at my son over there when I say that. I love my son very much. I'm not trying to give any innuendos there. Of course, Ezra's not in the room right now, right? <laughs> nah, you know, I had to say something. I don't mean that. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a blessing. But there is a proverb that says, a foolish son is a grief to his father. It says, a foolish son is destruction to his father. It's bitterness to his mother. In Jeremiah 31, 9, God says, for I am the father to Israel, and Ephraim, Israel, is my firstborn. Hosea 11, 1, when Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt, I called my son. We see that fulfilled in Matthew 2, 15, Jesus and Israel. G Israel failed to be the light. Jesus rescues them, fulfills their role. So now they can be the light that God intended them to be, to light the world through him. Israel was considered Egypt. You see in Revelation 11, 8, <clears throat> their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is mystically called Sodom and Egypt, the place where the Lord was crucified. And this is what the Feast of Booths was all about, this celebratory anticipation of God coming and fulfilling his word that the Messiah would come to restore Israel. He was to come to bring the light, a big tradition uh, uh, of the Jewish messiahs. And those that the false messiahs that came would claim to be the light. There was a false messiah, uh, uh, Simon ben Kaziba, who they called uh, Kochba. His name, and this is A.D. 132 <clears throat> to A.D. 135. He actually made coins with his name on it. And he, he put on there, son of light. His name means son of the morning star. And he and his followers thought he was a great light from heaven. Obviously, he was not the Messiah. So God reestablishes the role of, of Israel. Jesus does this so that nations will come to this light. 
and kings to the brightness of his rising. Isaiah 63 and Revelation 21, 24, both the same scriptures. But of course, they were unable to see the vision of Israel's vocation. We talked about yesterday at our meeting that the vision of our church is so important. It said, for lack of vision, my people perish. The scripture of Proverbs says. It says, for lack of vision in the original Hebrew is that my people perish because they are unrestrained unrestrained right we think of freedom as being unrestrained like yes i'm free i can do whatever i want there's no restraint this is great no vision comes with restraint with a specific path the jewish people did not see this path vision is so important even in our own jobs <clears throat> i love reading about these people that have work their way up to a top of a company. I just pulled this people here that <clears throat> one guy that I'm aware of because I have a fitness background, his name is Chris Rondo. He's 45 years old. At age 20, he started at Planet Fitness at the front desk. He walked, he was working part-time while he was at the um, college. And uh, a year after he was working there, he started full-time and he went from front desk to be a personal trainer. And then he became a manager. When they opened his third, when they opened the third chain or the third store, the third gym, he met with the owners and it's, he was saying, instead of all this marketing and advertising that we're doing, which is promoting our equipment, he said, let's promote something different. Let's promote and sell the atmosphere of our gym. They love the idea. And the logo and the mission statement that you see today with Planet Fitness is because of this guy's idea and vision of where he wanted to go. It catapulted the company and they made him a full partner when they started franchising. Now he is 45 years old. And I believe that because of this vision, now I don't, I, I don't like Planet Fitness personally, but I don't know, so I'm not plugging that and I'm not against it for those of you that go there either. But I have to say the marketing is genius. The niche that they have is genius. Why? Because of the vision. Mary T. Barra is another uh, example in her late 50s. At 18, she got a job at the assembly line at General Motors, inspecting hoods and fenders. And uh, she became a student in 1980 of uh, General Motors Institute and Pontiac Motor Division. Over the next decade, she rose in the rank, taking on a number of titles, became vice president, and in 2014 was named CEO and two, later, two years later became the chairman of the company. And if you read her story as well, it's a story of, of vision. Israel did not have this vision. We have to realize that as the church, we're not replacing Israel, but Israel is fulfilled in the new covenant. Jesus had 12 apostles. Jesus is reenacting all these old things from the Old Testament to show that this is the new creation. This is the new Israel. He is reestablishing Israel as the light of the world. Now, where is our vision as a church? Well, our vision as a church is the fact that this is the word of God. Yes. And that's what we're going to do. As if, if you didn't pick up a copy of our vision, it's back there by where Wayne is sitting. It should be back there on the table. Pick up a copy on the way out. There you go. And we'll, we'll outline it. But why is there a vision? Why is it just that we just say, hey, let's just get everybody to save many people saved as we can. And let's just nourish ourselves. Let's just have these inward sort of activities. And let's just have a Bible study and just feed ourselves and feed ourselves. And feed. Nothing wrong with Bible study. Nothing wrong with evangelism. we got to do it. But we are part of the greatest organization in the entire world that's going to one of the greatest places in history. And that is the new creation. And everything we do, Israel didn't see this. They were blinded. Everything we do is building towards that. But they were inward focused. And as a church, we have to be outward focused. We have to be the prophetic voice and light to the world and the world systems around us. We can't hate the sin and not the systems that produce the sin. The church has to be the one to shine the light, to show that the word of God is the standard in all areas of life. 
Jesus is not contained. There's no place that's off limits. God's witness to the earth is through his people, and his people are unlimited. It's the light of the world. The third point is that he is the light as the true human. <clears throat> Jesus, when Adam was the first project, Adam was to be that light. He was to reflect the glory of God out into creation, to subdue all of the things that are around. Everything in the land was his to take dominion over. And he was to bring glory to God, and he was to be fruitful and multiply. But what happened was as he fell into sin. So then God raised up Abraham and started the nation of Israel. And as we just said, they failed. So when Jesus comes and fulfills the law and also defeats sin and evil, he fulfills the role of Adam and he fulfills the role of Israel at the same time in one swift punch at the cross. He was to shine the light of God out into the world, but he failed. It says here, for as in Adam all die, but so in Christ all are made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, a few verses after. It's also written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last man, Adam, the last Adam, I'm sorry, became a life-giving spirit. You see, there's a very, very unique thing about this scripture here. We, we, we get it right in verse 20, and it's sort of like you say, well, why is John throwing this in here? You know, always when something's in scripture, it's not just there accidentally. Jesus says in verse 19, you know, they're saying, where's your father? And he says, you don't know neither me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. So why not just end it there and then say, well, then he said again to them, I go away. He says here, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one sees them because his hour, his time, that appointed time had not come. So they're showing us this, <clears throat> that on this last day of the festival, Jesus is in the treasury. Now, if you see, I'm going to show, when I send my email out on Tuesday, I'll send you a picture of this so you can really get a picture, a glimpse of what I'm talking about. But the temple had an outer court where all the Gentiles were allowed. <laughs> and then inside the first gate, there is called the court of the women. And that goes in through a little hallway to the court of the men where the priests are. The men and women were separate. Okay, Same in the synagogue, even today. They sit on one side, men sit on the other side. And so in the treasury area, uh, we have combined with the treasury area, we have the court of the women. Now, the treasury had all of these. Remember when Jesus was talking about the woman who threw two cents into the treasury and she gave more than anybody? And you often wonder, like, how did Jesus know how much she gave? Right. Well, the treasury was set up with all these big wooden uh, funnels. And, you know, it would say. Uh, money for the poor, money for the temple, money for maintenance, money for the Levites. So wherever you put your tithe and your money, it would get thrown in and it would go all the way down into this tube. And then at the bottom, underneath the temple is where all the money would, would fall in. And then they would go and break it out. <clears throat> so, but the, but the way that they did it was that, so if you threw the money in, it would make a loud sound. So if somebody threw in a whole bunch of money, it would echo, right? All the change, you can imagine what it would sound like. So when somebody threw the, the, the change in, two cents, you could tell that it was only two cents because of the echo that it made. It banged back and forth. Now, what does that have to do with this? Absolutely nothing. I just thought I would throw that in there. What it has to do is the treasury is the court of the women. So they're, they're sitting around there. And inside the court of the women, on the last day of this feast, there would be something called the illumination of the candles. Now we know that we see, the, the, we call it the menorah, right? The menorah, the seven candles. Well, what they did is they had these menorahs, what they, what they would do at the end of the temple, they were literally, um, let me see if I have the, the square, I think they were something like 70 feet high and they were in each corner of the temple. So John's telling us this is in the treasury, in the court of the women, and we have these gigantic, huge candles that when they were illuminated and lit up all of Jerusalem, like it's almost like when you're driving at night to Atlantic city and you can see if you're on the, on the Atlantic city expressway, you can see 
the lights from Atlantic City from miles away. If you're going down the parkway and going to Wildwood, you can look to the left and see at night the ray. And that is sort of what the picture was in Jerusalem when these things illuminated and they lit up. Which is so cool because this is why Jesus was saying, I am the light of the world. And why I believe the third point of Jesus being ultimately human is very tied in being the ultimate human, very tied in to this lighting ceremony. So how does that, how does that work? Well, <clears throat> obviously we talked about them being, uh, they were unable to believe that Jesus was the light, meaning he was God, that he was the light, meaning he was Israel and that the light being the second Adam. But the answer to the question on how this second Adam works is how he is the light of the world. How does this happen? In John chapter 9, verse 5, he says, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, what does that presuppose? It supposes that he's going to be out of the world. And what's going to be gone along with him? His light. He says in 1236, while you have the light, while I'm here, believe in the light. So that you may become sons of light. And these things Jesus spoke and then he went away and hid himself. So Jesus seemed to say, yes, I am the light of the world. I am the God of the Old Testament. I am the true Israel. I am the true Adam. But guess what? That light is going to be gone soon. Take advantage of it while it's here. But how we know that Jesus was saying that he who walks in darkness will have the light of life. There's, there's a temporary aspect to this that Jesus is going to leave us without light. But there's also a permanent aspect of this where he's always going to be with us. How is he to be the light when he's gone? Well, we know, I hope that we know that Jesus had to leave. And he said in, in, in um, John 14, 15, and 16, he talks about the fact that when he leaves, it's going to be better because he can send the Holy Spirit. And this is the key to getting the gospel out to the nations. You see, if Jesus didn't send the Holy Spirit, the plan doesn't work because we can't take Jerusalem out to the world. We can't take the temple. We can't make everybody come to the temple. That's a work. But what does Jesus do? He makes us into living temples that can contain that light. There's a scripture, John 16, 7, but I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. The helper will not come. He is going to come. And he is going to convict the world of righteousness. He is going to convict the world concerning sin. And he's going to convict the world of judgment. And then Jesus goes on to say, I'm convicting the world concerning sin. Because what? Because they don't believe in me. The Holy Spirit is convicting the world because they don't believe in him. Because of righteousness. Because Jesus is going away to the Father. They're not going to see righteousness anymore. So the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of righteousness, convict the world of sin. And then finally, he is going to convict the world. The third is judgment. And he says, because the ruler of this world is defeated. But how does all this happen? It happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> yes, but it happens through the, through the back to the plan now of Israel going out to be the light of the world, but through the individuals that are that living temple with the light inside of them. That is you and that is me. We are to go out and now replicate what Jesus was to Israel. We now need to be to the world. Be that light. Let it shine out. Jesus tells us in Matthew, you are the light of the world not 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 just him so we see here jesus referring to yes i am the light of the world but how are you in the light of the world lord and me in the light of the world that doesn't make sense no it's because he is in us through the power of the holy spirit the holy spirit resides in us a city set on the hill cannot be hidden nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but when we are inward focused what happens is as we take our light and we cover it up we just love that little light like you're like you're reading a book at night and you don't want no one to see you just you just so you don't want to wake up the person next to you so you put the blanket over you turn your light on that's not what we're called to do 
we're called to go out and be that light. Follow the Holy Spirit. Follow the leading. Do exactly what Jesus has called us to do. What that is for you, what that is for me, I don't know. But I often get asked, well, Pat, what if I know I have a feeling what God wants me to do, but I'm sure I'm really not sure. I really want to serve the Lord, Pat. I really want to be used. I don't know what ministry God has called me to. How do I go out and be the light? Well, first of all, you have to answer that question. The Lord knows that. You have to pray. But I always like to tell people, if you want to know where to start, start by serving where there's a need. Start by serving where there's a need. That cup has been on the floor through the whole sermon. Somebody should pick that up. I was just kidding, but I'm serious. I'm joking, but I'm kidding, right? I'm not saying pick it up now. But by serving the Lord in your local church, one of the things and part of this vision is to, to not for us to be pastor-centric, but for us to be outwardly centric to the world by having each of us do what it is that God has called us to do. It, and I'll tell you this right now. If you're a husband or a wife, I'll tell you what, that's a great place to start with your husband, with your wife. If you're a son or a daughter, a great place to start is with your brother, with your sister, with your father, with your mother. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the light of God of Israel, the light of the true Israel, and the light of the world through us. You know, I was being involved in this whole sermon this week about light. I was I was looking at the a lot of articles and things like that, and one I came across was talking about how the light, how we, how we process light uh, in our eyes. And first of all, uh, we have to have our eyes open and exposed to the light. The cornea takes the light in first. It helps us focus. The pupil controls the amount of light. Our eye lens works with the cornea in terms of focus. And the most amazing is the retina in the back. When it gets the light, it immediately attaches those rays of light to photoreceptors, which then turn the light into electric signals, which then turn the light down into the optic nerve, which then creates the image that we see all in these microseconds. It's absolutely amazing. This amazing process I was thinking about, this amazing process of our light that gets, could be immediately taken away and shut out by simply closing your eyes. By simply closing your eyes. I often say that you could block out the brightest star that we could see, the sun, with something as small as a pen by just putting it right here. Block the whole sun right out. We have to open our eyes and come to the light of Christ. It has to be. Jesus is going to lead you, but he wants you to deliberately look and deliberately follow. I also found out that for our eyes to process light properly, one of the most essential things that are required are tears. I thought, I thought Elvira would be, uh, she, she always talks about the tears that are good, but we're gonna we're gonna have no pain in heaven, and we're gonna have no troubles and trials, but we're gonna still have tears, right? Tears of joy. But you, I'm not promising you that your following this light is going to be a, always a happy-go-lucky experience. It may be an experience that requires tears at first, but knowing there's no other way, I want you to know that there's no other way out of the darkness other than through Jesus Christ. And so next week we will uh, take another chunk of verses um, and, and more in depth that Jesus goes with the Pharisees. Next week he really starts to talk about sin and the, and the, and the, the dangers of sin. And he also starts to talk about Satan and his role. So I look forward to doing that. Um, so as we as we uh, sing this last song, why don't we all stand together? Step by step, and forever be the same.